Alien 5, one last sequel with Sigourney Weaver, is the topic of today's episode of the J.R. Perez podcast. Welcome back to the show. My name is J.R. Perez, and I am the brains and muscle behind this operation. On this occasion, we will be visiting another long-running franchise, which to me is also extremely interesting, and one which has plenty of life in it yet. And as always, we will also enjoy a nice piece of music I procured, as well as a reading of Reluctant Genius, a very short tale about an alien intervention here on Earth. I decided to dedicate the seventh episode of the podcast to the Alien franchise because it is no doubt one which is moving full steam ahead, but it appears as though it is doing so without its heroine, the monumental and irreplaceable Ellen Ripley. And though this is logical, Sigourney Weaver is in her 70s after all and can't be counted on to move the franchise forward, it does not mean that she is down and out. It is quite the opposite in my opinion. I believe she has at least one more outing left. In the following exposition, I lay it all out and it is fantastic. Let's check it out. With its TV spin-off around the corner and a new film currently in production, it is clear that the Alien franchise is still in play and will be well into the future. This begs the question of how the original films will fit into that future and what Ellen Ripley's fate will be. Given Sigourney Weaver's age, it would be easy to cast her out and reboot the series or simply continue without her, but there are ways for her to return in a relevant way, finish Ripley's story, and introduce a new cast. In nearly 25 years, the Alien franchise has received a respectable amount of attention. In the 2000s, it received two AVP films, Alien vs. Predator in 2004 and Alien vs. Predator Requiem in 2007. The following decade brought us Prometheus in 2012 and Alien Covenant in 2017. And the 2020s are bringing an as of yet untitled film directed by Fede Alvarez and a television series expected to enter production in 2023. The first two films are crossovers and therefore are not part of the series. The last two are distant prequels which have yet to connect to the first film and the upcoming works are a film set separately from the earlier releases and a TV series set on Earth in the near future. Apart from these efforts to expand the franchise, no production has materialized as a direct follow-up to 1997's Alien Resurrection, and it is not for lack of trying or intention. The film ends on Earth, a deliberate act by writer Joss Whedon, since he had written, or wrote sometime after, an Earth set sequel. This idea was rejected by Sigourney Weaver, who at the 2014 Hero Complex Film Festival explained, I don't think Alien belongs on Earth popping out of a haystack. She was more interested in returning to the setting of the first film. At the same festival, she further explained, it should take place in the far reaches of the universe where no one in their right mind would go. A second attempt may have been orchestrated by James Cameron, who before Alien vs Predator was greenlit had been collaborating with another writer on the plot of a fifth film. He ceased work upon learning of the plans for the crossover. In 2008, talks of a film arose once again, this time a spin-off focused on the chronicles of Ripley rather than on the aliens. It didn't go anywhere either. A third attempt at a direct sequel, although not to Alien Resurrection, originated in 2015 when Neil Blomkamp posted concept art for what appeared to be his take on a follow-up to Aliens. This one would bring back Sigourney Weaver and Michael Bean and ignore Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection. Weaver expressed interest in Blomkamp's take, but it was ultimately cancelled in favor of Ridley Scott's third prequel, itself also cancelled due to the disappointing box office results of Alien Covenant. Regarding Blomkamp's efforts, Scott expressed, There was never a script. It was an idea that evolved from, I believe, a 10-page pitch, and I was meant to be part of the producers on that. It didn't evolve. Fox decided they didn't want to do it, and that was it. It is worth mentioning, very much so, that James Cameron stated in 2019 that he was working on reviving the project. The most recent attempt, as recent as June 2020, came from longtime Alien franchise producer Walter Hill. His 50-page treatment, which is now not moving forward, 
is believed to have also had the intention of doing away with parts 3 and 4. This most recent development is one that Weaver expressed doubts about, saying, I don't know, Ridley has gone in a different direction. Maybe Ripley has done her bit. She deserves a rest. And while she is not wrong about how things have changed and how Ripley deserves a rest, the actual send-off should be adequate and memorable given what she has meant for the franchise and overall what the character has meant as a heroine. In my opinion, she cannot be caught off at the knees. It cannot end at Alien Resurrection for her, given that the film provides ways for her to be brought back one last time along with a 70-plus year old Sigourney Weaver. The film takes Ripley 8 to Earth, where the next adventure would take place, and ends on that note. Whether the Earth shown is the post-apocalyptic wasteland seen on the special edition of the film, or the blank canvas that the theatrical version allows it to be, is irrelevant, as Ripley 8 is more than able to deal with any and all challenges she might encounter. This is especially so given the potential resources she could ultimately find and take advantage of. The violent and ferocious behavior she displayed in the film, aside characteristics such as acidic blood and metallic teeth and nails, would allow for self-defense in case she faces any earthly predators. Her superior strength, jumping skills and endurance would also be helpful in such occasions, as well as when dealing with any other of the not so friendly aspects of our beloved planet. Aside from that, she counts on rapid cell regeneration and genetic memory. The former would allow her to come back from any injury sustained and the latter would give her access to Ellen Ripley's memories, which could be utilized to whatever extent they are useful. Finally, the passage of time, like the 57 years between the first and second films and the 200 years between the third and fourth, could very easily account for an older Ripley 8. Given that this Earth-based Ripley 8 would be keeping sharp every skill she has and any new one she develops, that she has the memories of Ellen Ripley, who was in the first three films and has seen, fought and beaten the aliens, and has experienced alien resurrection, it is safe to say that she would be a major asset which is uniquely qualified to deal with alien-related situations, at least. Yes, she could be cloned again in outer space, as was done in Alien Resurrection with Ellen's DNA, but how adventurous is that? Ripley 8 is ready to be needed, consulted with, and thrown back into action. With a fifth film, she could come back to help solve another problem, finish her story, and make way for a new cast to carry the franchise onward and hopefully upward. This was one of the six articles I previously mentioned I wrote not too long ago in an attempt to get work with the entertainment content and news website Screen Rant that ultimately went nowhere. I will include links to the movies, novels and more for your convenience. It will all be in the description section as well as on a dedicated blog post on my website jrperez.net. The link to the blog post will also be in the video description. Please remember that sometimes some links are affiliate links and any purchase you make via these links will allow me to make a commission from those sales. Now on to the music. Today it's another instrumental called Deep Horrors. It is a cinematic track by composer and music producer Kevin McLeod and I grabbed it from the YouTube audio library. Let's have a listen.
How was that? I myself like this one because it sounds like the very music you would find in the Alien franchise. Now, let's keep the Alien theme going and listen to a reading of Reluctant Genius by Henry Sleazar. It is a short tale about aliens who intervene here on Earth and inspire a well-known human genius. Let's listen. Reluctant Genius by Henry Sleesar It is said that life crawled up from the slime of the sea bottoms and became man because of inherent greatness bred into him before the dawn of time. But perhaps this urge was not as formless as we think. Vos was chastising Laloy as they sped through the ionosphere of the green planet. But like the airy creature she was, Laloy ignored the criticism and rippled zephyr-like through a clump of daffodils when they completed their descent. So pretty, she sighed. She flung her incorporeal substance around each flower, absorbing their unified beauty of scent, sight, and feel. Vos shrilled himself into a column of wind and expressed his displeasure at her attitude. Stupid, silly, shallow thing, he said, if the others only knew how you behaved. And you'll be glad to tell them, of course, she said, extending her fingers of air into the roots of the wind-bent grass. She rolled across the hill ecstatically, and Vos followed in grumbling billows of energy. I don't carry tales, he replied, somewhat mortified, but we're here as observers, and you insist upon making this world a plaything. I love it, she said happily. It's so warm and green. Vos whipped in front of her angrily. This is an assignment, he snapped, his emotion crackling the air about him. We have a purpose here. Purpose, she groaned, settling over a patch of crowded clover. How many centuries will this assignment last? This world is young, said Vos. It will take time. But how long, she asked mournfully. Our world will be shriveled and dead before these people have the knowledge to rescue us. Why can't we spend our lives here? And leave the others behind, said Vos stiffly. Selfish being, he said sadly, this world cannot support one-fourth our number. Oh, I know, I know, Leloy said, I do not mean to say such things. I am twisted by my sorrow. As if to express her self-abnegation, she corkscrewed out of the clover and into a thin spiral of near nothingness. Settle down, foolish one, said Vos, not unkindly. I know your feelings. Do you think I am not tormented as well by the slow pace of these earth things? Crude, barbaric beings like children with the building blocks of science. They have such a long way to go. And so few know, said Leloy despairingly, a handful of seeing minds, tens of millions of ignorant ones. Not even first principles. They're stupid, stupid. But they will learn, Bois said stubbornly. That is historical fact. Some day they will know the true meaning of matter and light and energy. Slowly, yes, slowly. But in terms of their growth it will seem like great speed to them. And in terms of our world, said Laloy, spinning sadly over the ground, they may be far too late. No. In his excitement, Bois forgot himself and entwined with the flowing form of the she-creature, and the result was a rending of the air that cracked like heat lightning over the field. No, he repeated again, they must not be too late. They must learn. They must build from the very ground, and then they must fly, and then their eyes must be lifted to the stars, and desire must extend them to all the universe. It seems so hopeless. It cannot be. Our destiny is not extinction. They must come to us in fleets of silver and replant our soil and send towers of green shooting into our sky, breathing out air. Yes, yes, Laloy cried pitifully. It will be that way, Bois. It will be that way. That man-creature, we will begin with him. Bois floated earthward disconsolately. He is a dreamer, he said cheerlessly. His mind is good, he thinks of tomorrow, he is one of the knowing ones, but he cannot be moved, Laloy. His thoughts may fester and die in the prison of his brain. No, they will not. We have watched him. He understands much. He will help us. I have seen his like before, said Bois helplessly. He thinks and he works, and his conclusions will die stillborn for lack of a moving force. Then let us provide it, Bois. Let us move him. With what? said the other disdainfully. Arms of nothing, hands of vacuum, a, a breeze against his cheek, a rustle of leaves, a meaningless whistle in his ear. Let us try, 
Let us try. This empty watchfulness is destroying us. Let us move him, Boaz. Come." Faster than the sky-sweeping clouds they flew over the gently swelling hills, over the yearning branches of the trees, over the calm blue waters of the lakes. Swifter than the flight of birds they came, searching for a thinking mind. They found him at last. He knows, he knows, said Laloy. Only now to say, this is so because, and this must happen when, only to think, to understand. They hovered over his head in a pandemonium of helplessness. They whirled and tumbled and shrilly circled. And then to Laloy the inspiration came. The apple caught by a sudden gust of wind, twisted from the tenuous hold of the tree and fell to the ground. The man, startled, picked it up. He gazed at it, deep in thought. End of Reluctant Genius by Henry Sleesar And there you go. What do you think? I myself was not expecting it to be about alien visitors. Needless to say, or maybe I do need to say it, it was a very, very, very pleasant surprise. Anyway, Henry Sleesar was an American author, playwright, and copywriter who was famous for his use of irony and twist endings. This concludes the seventh episode of the J.R. Perez podcast. I will now proceed with the customary call to action. If you like what you heard and would like to come along for the journey, be sure to follow us, or me, you will find all the pertinent links related to today's content in the description area or comment section in whichever platform you happen to be listening. If you know of others who would also enjoy the podcast, please share it with them or otherwise inform them about it. I would be most appreciative. That is all for today. This is J.R. Perez signing out.